So welcome everyone uh, to the 2024 uh, Sustainability Partnerships Agenda event. This is our third event uh, of this kind. We started in 2021 and we always start every year with um, an agenda event to kick off um, the sentiment, the narrative uh, for the year and what we find uh, those within the NHS find um, important for the year ahead. So um, I'm going to start uh, with an introduction video. We are then going to hear from uh, Nikki Stevens. She'll going to uh, introduce herself. We then have Richard Schofield finishing off with Ben Tong. And we have um, an extra special guest, uh, Tim Evans, as well, who's going to say hello. So um, I'm going to start with my um, animation, which is... Um, gives everyone a bit of a, a feel for for what we're all about so everyone um in the panel is going to have to let me know um by a way of thumbs up that you can see my screen right thanks nikki appreciate that um and also by thumbs up um that you can hear the this as well Um, so as you can see from some of the statistics um, in there, we have been running this for the last three years and we are incredibly proud, uh, proud of of what we've been able to put together, the um, engagement that we get from within the NHS and the uh, and businesses alike. Um, we're really, really happy to see so many people here today, um, so many people from across the entire country um, and just ongoing support. Um, and we hope to be able to serve you uh, with a similar um, support, um, engagement and, um, and content that's valuable to you throughout the year. Um, I'm going to pass over to you, Nikki, so that we we keep on track because I'm the one who's supposed to be timekeeping and I'm the worst for doing it. So I'm going to let you jump straight in. Please introduce yourself. Tell us where you come from today um, and go through what you've got to present for us. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start presenting already, if that's OK. Give me a sec. So can you let me know if you can see that? That's perfect, Nikki, thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, so hello everybody. I'm Nikki Stevens. I'm the Environment and Sustainability Manager for the Welsh Ambulance Service, or WAST as, as we call it. I've been that for about eight years now, but I've been with the Trust for nearly 13. Um, we're the only ambulance service for the country, um, both emergency and non-emergency. 111 call taking, patient transfer, things like that. Um, of course, we're also supported by a really great um, volunteer service, community first responders. It's really key that we make sure we mention them at all costs. Um, so the estate is extremely diverse um, across the country. We've got 115 buildings at the moment, um, from a £13.5 million build all the way down to a stone cottage So um, and everything in between. Um, we have over 800 frontline vehicles, um, all are Euro 6 engine, but we do have a few um, plug-in hybrids, no full EV vehicles at the moment. So just to give you a bit of a background on what's happening within Wales, so we have some very bespoke um, legislation within this country. And that started in 2015 with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and that includes seven wellbeing goals, including lots of different things like resilience and health and community. But it's all underpinned by a, a sustainable development principle, which is really key to the legislation that's been written. Um, the Environment Wales Act came into force in 2016. 
And um, also in 2016, all NHS trusts within Wales were asked to become 14,001 accredited. Um, I, I believe we're the only ambulance service in the UK to have ISO 14,001 for um, everything that we do, but I, I'm, I'm not too sure. And then um, in 2016, um, the addition to that, that in 2019, Wales declared a climate emergency. And because of that, the Welsh Government wrote lots of different legislation, mainly for public bodies, which accumulated into the NHS Wales Decarbonisation Strategic Delivery Plan, which is a key piece of documentation that we need to enforce within this organisation. Um, there's lots of different actions for us within this plan, um, reducing our emissions by 34% by 2030 is, is the big one. Um, lots of different um, direct actions around our fleets, making all of our fleets um, EV by 2030, which is a huge ask um, and something we found quite difficult. Um, retrofitting all of our estates to be carbon um, zero, um, looking at installing renewables, installing in biodiversity, lots of alternative care pathways. You know, do we have to send an ambulance out to somebody? Can an alternative care pathway support that person better? Um, trialling lots of technology. We've been looking at drones and all sorts of things to try and support um, those different ways of working. Working together in a very um, cohesive way and working with others as well, which is really important. We do do that in, in Wales um, quite well, work with other public bodies, but we need to start working with the private sector in a very different way as well. Um, and that's going to be what's key to us achieving all of these targets and actions. Um, so the last couple of years, we've done quite a few pieces of work on our estate. Um, we've installed um, quite a bit of PV. Um, we've done the basics, as you would imagine, the building envelope, single glazing for double glazing, um, replacing obsolete heating systems and quite old heating systems for air source heat pumps, um, LED making sure that runs through our estate. Um, biodiversity has been quite a difficult one for us because our estate doesn't really have an awful lot of land. But we do have two hectares of land in North Wales, which we've been able to plant two and a half thousand trees at. Um, and that site's also running as a well-being area for our staff. Um, and progressing with all different bits of development, looking at a bespoke BMS system for our estate because it's so varied, it's quite difficult to actually have a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, and for all of that work, that's reduced our operational carbon um, from those buildings from by over 55%. Um, and considering most of those um, pieces of work were not whole of building pieces of work, um, it's done extremely well. So our, our fleet is our, our main issue when it comes to emissions. Um, we've done lots of things over the years to try and reduce our emissions from our fleet. And that included um, installing solar film and then solar panels on all of our vehicles to reduce the electricity we need to run the electrical equipment that's required inside the back of an ambulance. So all of the clinical equipment, defibrillators and things like that. Um, We've purchased 54 self-generating hybrid rapid response vehicles and 24 plug-in um, hybrid response vehicles. We are looking to purchase full EV ones in the next financial year, but that um, is sat with Welsh Government at the moment and hopefully we'll get the funding with that. Um, State-of-the-art bespoke vehicle telemetry system. Our fleet team have worked really, really, diff really well with a company called Chevin um, to try and generate a a telemetry system that will work for us, but also produce all of the emission information that we need for all of our estate, all of our vehicles, as well as the estate when it's being plugged into our estate. And I think that's that's also key to electric vehicles is understanding where the emissions are sitting. Um, working with all different manufacturers, um, looking at emerging technology, looking at innovation, working with Swansea University um, and their research team there. Because um, we, we want to get this right. We want it to be a lot better. Um, we've installed um, a significantly large um, network of EV charging points across this country. And 70 doesn't sound like an awful lot, but for a very small country, um, it's not too bad. Um, 
We've done reviews of all of our estate, the electrical capacity requirements that we need to install all of the additional EV charging that we need. Um, and trying to look at um, a technological link between our EV system, which is based in our estate and our fleet, um, and understanding how we can make things work properly together. So what next? An awful lot needs to happen next. Um, we're looking at integrating decarbonisation within this trust. So everything that happens within this trust has a key back to decarbonisation and sustainability. Um, looking at our decarbonisation action plan, monitoring its structure, making sure the right people understand what it is and what their actions are. Um, we've published a sustainable retrofit design guide for WAST buildings. It's bespoke to our estate. Um, that will support our capital delivery team um, in retrofitting our estates to a very um, safe level, um, rather than making sure we don't go a little bit overboard in some of our, our estate buildings. Um, working with others within the Welsh uh, government to see if we can get some more support. And we have been very lucky to get support from some of our local authorities. Um, a waste reduction plan, zero waste to landfill is really important to us. We've reduced our waste to landfill significantly in the last few years. Looking at a sustainable travel plan, um, it's quite difficult in this country. Our um, public transport's not the best um, and it's quite difficult to get around. So it's um, it's quite difficult to do that within, within some of the regions um, of this country. Um, continuing to work with other NHS partners, public sector partners, and we do that very well, not just in, in uh, Wales, but also in, in England. Um, integrating our ISO 14001 um, accreditation in with our decarbonisation action plan, rather than seeing them both in silo, trying to amalgamate that both together. And then, of course, planning. Planning for the next five years um, is going to be key to see if we can actually achieve these um, significant targets. I wanted just to put a slide in about limitations. I think it's really important that we speak about limitations because um, you can't ignore them. Um, these are six of our, our key limitations, unfortunately. Uh, resource, um, the people to do all of this and the money to do it all. You know, it's not endless pots of money anywhere. And it's public money. Um, as taxpayers' money, we have to spend it wisely. Um, electrical capacity. Electrical capacity in the UK is not excellent. Um, and into Wales itself um, is even worse. Um, into our estates uh, is extremely poor. So having to work with the electrical capacity constraints has been difficult. Um, time, you know, we've only got a few years left. It's challenging to try and meet all of these targets in the next six years when it's taken us four years to get to this point. Um, so it's definitely a challenge looking at that particular time scale. Um, lack of technology, there's lots of research and development happening and we're having support from all different public sector bodies around this and vehicle manufacturers. But unfortunately, technology is not quite there yet. Um, there is such a thing as, as an electric ambulance. Um, it doesn't work for us. In Wales, our specifications are quite different to England. Um, so we're really just not quite there yet. Hydrogen fuel cell would be much better, but we are definitely nowhere near that, that point. Um, our country, I mean, I, I love being Welsh, very proud to be Welsh, but uh, the geography and terrain of our country um, can inhibit some things happening. We do have sections of this country that don't actually have internet yet. Um, so it is quite difficult um, and challenging to, to meet lots of different targets around transportation. Um, when to get from A to B isn't as simple as driving in a straight line. Um, a number one um, rule definitely is patient safety. Um, I cannot be responsible for somebody not getting to hospital because their ambulance ran out of electricity. And, it, and it's something that is really key. Um, for everybody to note that patient safety within the NHS is the number one priority and everything else is second. We need to do all of this and make sure that we don't um, hurt anybody in, in our journey. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Has anybody got any questions? Wow. Um, that was a lot, uh, Nikki. I'm so <laughs> impressed.
Oh, impressed. Um, absolutely. You, you know, you guys are so ahead of the curve with the, the solar film, the solar panels, your, your ISO and uh, your telemetry stuff. You know, we always say that you can't change what you don't measure. I, I feel like you you really have so much covered, but not only that, you are being very, very blatant and overt about things that you can't do or, or things that you have limitations on. So I really appreciate you putting that in there as well. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Nikki, we're actually going to do um, a, the Q&A session after everyone's done their talks. Uh, and please, as I, as I mentioned before, use that Q&A um, panel as opposed to the chat panel, otherwise I'll just lose all of your questions. And that's not what we want to do. I have loads of questions for you myself, Nikki, and I wish that I could keep you on just to, just to start going at you with, with all the, it's so multifaceted uh, for, for such a small region, but I feel like you, it feels manageable and it feels like so proactive, everything that, that you're talking about. It's it's really, really refreshing and, and, and uh, interesting to see as well, particularly talking about working with academics and cross sector integration and collaboration instead of working in silos. That type of mentality is super refreshing to see. So really excited to see all of that stuff as well. Um like I said, please, um, any questions put in, in that q and I do see people raising their hands as well. Um, I'm not able to give anyone access to come on and, and ask questions verbally. They do need to go into the Q&A. So anyone who's put their hands up, if you do have a question, please ask it there. Uh, that would be really helpful. I'm going to jump straight into you, uh, Richard. Um, again, I'm concerned that I'm not very good at timekeeping. So please uh, um, let us know who you are um, and what you have to share with us today. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm Richard Schofield. I'm the SRO for Green Row NHS for the Southwest region of NHS England. So a region which has uh, seven separate systems in it and quite with quite a low population spread out over quite a long geography, uh, quite a big geography. So seven systems, 40 odd trusts, lots of community hospitals, lots of quite isolated primary care. So quite an interesting region to work in. Um, first of all, we're all, in, we're all in quite an unusual place being involved in this programme in the NHS because it's a programme that's actually delivering on its targets at the moment, which we should all hold on to for dear life. And let's hope we can continue that. So, you know, an optimistic starting point. And certainly from my perspective in the last, since I've taken over this role, much more engagement throughout systems and trust than we would have seen even 18 months ago. So that's all really good stuff. So just one area of major development from the Southwest, and I'll move on to some of the more mainstream stuff. So last year, we volunteered as a region to develop the NHS Net Zero work out of, out of or beyond travel and transport, medicines and estates, and into major service design, planning and implementation. And to try to move away from options appraisals that simply look at what's the carbon impact of an option and actually move it all the way forward to say, can we actually begin designing options for major service change, which are partly based on a reduced or low carbon option that then goes forward as an option through the process rather than simply being evaluated for carbon at the end. And we did that purely through demand from our systems. They're absolutely itching to build carbon elements at a really serious level into their major service reconfiguration, which is absolutely fantastic. So we've been working with Somerset, who've been redesigning their community hospital and community and out of hospital provision. And one of their key, one of their key um, building blocks around building options is how can we minimize the carbon impact and how can we take carbon out of the system whilst redesigning services fundamentally? Really exciting stuff. And so we in the region, with help from national colleagues and colleagues within the system, have been developing a, a sustainability tool that helps systems build options for the future, whether that's through a purely NHS-led service change or whether it's through um, procurement that could involve private or third sector, so that we're looking at sustainability through one tool, but which you can then use for many different purposes in terms of moving service design forward. And the feedback we're getting from that is really positive. And we think that in the next six to nine months, there will be procurements. There's some going on in Dorset at the moment. There's redesign work going on in Somerset and Devon that will actually have schemes which have been developed with decarbonisation in mind, rather than just looking at the impact of carbon on options that would have otherwise been developed. It's a really big step forward. 
And if it works, and if we can actually get options adopted on that are significantly informed by decarbonisation, we're really excited that we could roll that out across more systems and potentially nationally. So that's the big thing that we're putting a lot of resource into seeing whether we can make that work. And it's a really complex bit of work, but if we can do it, it'll be fantastic, I hopefully for the whole country. You can, I hope you can hear my enthusiasm for this. I spent a lot of my life on that stuff. And then moving up to some of the areas which are the kind of the traditional areas of driving carbon out of the core NHS. So what are we doing? So medicine, the medicines work, we're, we're doing really well on all the traditional stuff around, um, around gases and inhalers. We're doing really well on that. But again, what we're getting is a lot of appetite from our clinicians in the in community and primary care for them to say, what can we do in a structured way that's transferable from one practice to another, one PCN to another, one community hospital to another? And so the, so we, we asked people, which we gave them a menu of different ideas of which could we try and do at scale. And the one we came up with was a fantastic scheme, uh, which was created by a single GP, Deb Gompertz, in Somerset, which is called Check My Meds. So every time a clinician sees a patient who's a long-term patient with multiple conditions, they do a meds check. And what they find is 35, 30, 25 to 30 percent of meds are wasted, which has significant carbon impacts. It also has lots of other negative impacts around wastage. Also has clinical impacts about why patients what's the clinical outcome for patients who aren't taking the meds that they need or do they need them query but it's one of those it's one of those fantastic initiatives that can be done really easily that is clinically useful and is very easily transferable within the clinical community and which extends beyond extends us beyond some of the what we know are the big carbon elements around things like gases and inhalers so just taking these initiatives out into the community is proving really really powerful and then if if we look at estates we've there's loads of work going on in estates and we, and we know that our our estates colleagues have been really early adopters of the, the the carbon program going much earlier than there was ever anything called an nhs net zero program our colleagues in estates have been working on this agenda for decades probably certainly 10 to 15 years and so where next for them? Well, one of the things that we're going to really need to try to maximise out the opportunity for the NHS is access funding, not through traditional NHS routes, but like through things like the, the, the public sector decarbonisation scheme. And so one of the things that we looked at from the middle of last year and is now progressing through the schemes now is how can we support our NHS organisations to succeed in their bids for funding, not just from that scheme, but from others. And we did some research and, and it turned out that a lot of, a lot of organisations had very similar schemes and some were succeeding and some weren't in the bidding process. So we very simply put in some support to help organisations improve the way in which they responded to bidding processes. And in the last in the last round, compared to the the one before, the Southwest increases funding by a hundred percent, simply by some simple interventions around getting better collaboration between estates um, colleagues, finance colleagues, and clinical colleagues, and a little bit of help from us, just to make their bids better, so that in a public sector in the round bidding process, they did better. They got a bigger share of the pie. Sounds kind of simple, but in terms of bang for the buck, it's really effective. What we can't measure yet, though, is what the impact of these schemes are going to have. And that's a big headache nationally about how, how you can bake in, how these big scheme, big funding schemes are actually going to impact on net zero in the NHS. But we'll do that next. And then the final bit I wanted to talk about was the transport element. So just to say to Nikki over in Wales, we, we, we do have a few EV ambulances in the southwest and they do go out to some of the most rural areas that we have and we've made it work. So that kind of, you know, that's game changing stuff if we can get the funding to expand that. But it's really hopeful around all of that. So one the other things that we've done there around travel and transport, again, again, have been much more about 
supporting colleagues with information upon which to base their decisions. So one of the curious things we found was in a lot of organisations, all of whom have something called a fleet management function, but the fleet management function in some places can be really well resourced with specialists. And in other places, it can be part of one person's job who spends most of their time doing something else. And that something else is probably their core role, really. And so it's about how do you, how do you give those organisations with the least that have, that have the least resourcing into fleet, fleet management all the information that they need so that they can make good decisions quickly on the on the net zero agenda. So we've worked with a a group of colleagues across a number of NHS trusts to to develop a decarbonisation dashboard that fleet managers can use within each organisation, so that they can immediately see what's the profile of their fleet which which parts of their fleet are coming up for renewal and where the best opportunities will lie for them to have a positive carbon impact as they renew their fleet over time, which was a system which simply which didn't exist in a lot of our organisations and is particularly helpful in organisations where they don't have significant staff dedicated to this. It's a real shortcut to give them really good information. Because one of the areas in the southwest where which we're struggling on relative to others is the decarbonisation of the fleet. So we tried to find some information that would help people make better decisions quickly and spread that for adoption across the region, which uh, I think I'm hopeful that, that we will do in the next year. So that's a big priority for us. And then the final one um, is around some work that we've been doing with um, organisations like the um, Energy Savings trust um, and other public public sector bodies around um, integrated travel plans and how we support them, um, partly through public transport, but also through um, system of EV charging for both staff, patients and visitors on local sites, often at a very tactical level. So really micro EV charging opportunities across uh, on multiple sites, but potentially on quite small scale individuals that can have quite a large impact. And things like the availability even of quite of slow charges, for instance, for staff who can leave a car to charge over many hours at work. Those kind of very micro initiatives, as well as looking kind of at integrated transport plans with public and private sector partners. So what we tried to do is to come in with some really specific initiatives in each of the major pillars and try to spread them rather than work on 100 different ideas at quite small scale. So I'll stop there. I wish I'm happy to take questions now or later. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, Richard. Again, so much to go at, so multifaceted. Um, I love the piece around um, supporting people with information to make better decisions. Um, I feel like that's something that's quite intrinsic and that's something that we do at Sustainability Partnerships with all of the, the content and the the uh, the webinars and everything that we produce is, is just showing people what's out there so that the decisions are far more informed. Um, the piece around the bidding process, again, another really refreshing thing to hear for the start of the year, support for businesses to, to actually be able to communicate much better with the benefits that they have. And um, I think there's definitely going to be some questions around that. There's already some. Um, there are some questions for me um, around the webinar. Yes, it is being recorded. Um, they always go straight onto our website where you'll find the full write-up and any um, contact details that are shared from our panellists as well will be on there and any of the presentations that have been shown today will also be shared on there. Um, just um, as a note for Ben's next talk, he has just posted um, a um, link into the chat. If everyone can click on that, you're then able to answer some of the questions that he's going to pose um, as part of his presentation in the poll. Um, everyone will also receive this webinar um, through email. If you've signed up with the email, you will receive this webinar recording back through to the email that you're signed up with as well. Um, and so that's, I'm going to get rid of some of those questions. There are some questions um, also uh, stacking up for you, Nikki and Richard. So again, I'll wait until we've done Ben's piece. We'll go and 
to the, uh, we'll let uh, Tim say a little bit about uh, what they do at 3TI and then we'll go into the Q&A uh, straight after that. So um, Ben, do you want to share your screen and see if everyone's managed to log into your poll or are we going to do yeah, the sure thing. first and then the poll after? I'll start off, I'll be switching between the two. Okay, great. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, Ben Tong, I work for NHS England and the Transformation Director of Digital Net Zero League, running the Digital Work Team at the NET NHS programme. I'm a career sustainability professional, not managed to save the planet yet, maybe 2024 is the year. Um, and a member of IEMA, Chartered Environmentalist, and stuff like that. Um, I'm just going to tell you a bit today about the, the digital work stream and the kind of stuff that we're up to. We really have two hats. So we've got one that looks internally at NHS England. We're more of an, a, a robust assurance type framework. Ben, you are a little bit a little bit soft. Uh, I don't know if you could be a little bit louder if you don't. Yeah, mind. sure thing. Yeah. Uh, Thank looking you at so business much. papers and spent control assurance and things like that. Um, but the, the purpose of this presentation is really looking at how we can support the wider system on the basis that most of the audience today are represented by frontline provider representatives. Um, and so we'd, I'd like to kind of engage you guys a bit on what, what it is that we can do around this agenda. So first of all, just a really quick intro. So this is going to be sucking out most people on the call probably, but clearly the Greener NHS programme is primarily framed around decarbonisation, there's a graphic there, you can see some of the work streams, but also there's this climate change adaptation and resilience piece, which is a really live question for digital professionals within the health system at the moment and something that I'm working quite hard on. And then you can see there that Greener Digital is the digital work stream. We aim to support the system to create low carbon and climate change resilient digital health services. Um, we have an advisory guidance and support function across the whole NHS and this assurance function that I mentioned within NHS England. So that's us. Um, and this is the slide over it. So thanks very much for those who've managed to jump on. I've not done this before, so let's hope it goes OK. Um, so I'm just going to whistle through these. I don't know how many people have answered, but um, it's. I think it's a useful way to start conversations about this. So. Most people don't know, um, so clearly it's not a well understood thing here, but of those that do more, you know, a quarter have a resource accountabilities around the greener digital agenda. So um, that's, to be honest, is higher than I was expecting. So let, let's take that as positive. Um, I should note really that, oh, if people could jump on to the next question, there's three questions in there. Um, I should note really that when I first started working on this agenda, it was five years or so ago, it was really quite untrodden territory compared to other sustainability agendas. Richard mentioned there how long his estate function have been working on sustainability stuff. Um, and that, you know, I agree that's where a lot of it starts. But green, greener digital services has only really come to the fore in the last few years and it's starting to be a more significant thing now. So this, this is what I'm going to be getting out of it. Um, we can see here, numbers wise, some people are measuring some carbon costs associated with digital. That's great. But some perspective government, all government departments have been measuring carbon of their technology stack for about 15 years or so now. It's not something we do as a requirement in the Greener NHS as of yet. Um, so but hopefully it will be in due course. And then the last one here there is a third one in there so maybe i can come back to that at the end but if you guys can jump on the third question describe any greener digital products that you've got in your organization that'd be fantastic just to do a bit more poll of that and um, so i'm not going to kind of dwell on that for now but if people can jump on that and we can revisit it at the end that would be great uh just checking people can still see the slides for them i just i've not i've been jigging screens around yeah, we can see the slides. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So Thanks, now I was just going to um, do a bit of a, a quick informal quiz time. So I quite often start these sessions with a like, why should we bother thinking about digital sustainability? Surely it's not like a massive thing. So here's some like pub quiz type questions that hopefully will kind of make good dinner table conversation out um, as to why we should be thinking about this. So. Digital has a similar carbon footprint to aviation at the moment. By 2040, what percentage of global energy is predicted to go on digital? 
I'll just pause for two seconds each time. It's 14, so about a seventh of global energy. So this is a big thing. Um, the next one's looking at life cycle energy. So up to 90% of life cycle energy of end user devices like phones or laptops, tablets, is used in the manufacturing phase. For how many years would you need to run a smartphone to balance the amount of manufacturing energy with energy out of the wall? This is a great one. The answer is 34. How bad a banana? So who keeps their mobile phone for 34 years? Certainly not me. Um, ben, are we supposed Bitcoin. to be going to in these stats on the screen? Or are you just reading them out? No, no, I'm just reading them out. Oh, okay, sorry. So, I thought that maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Bit, Bitcoin is a famously high energy user. At the last account, the same as the country of Argentina, a single Bitcoin transaction, same carbon footprint as what distance flight? And the answer is transatlantic flight has the same carbon footprint as one Bitcoin transaction. So that's the archetypal digital service that's not designed for sustainability outcomes. Um, it does have other benefits, of course, um, but certainly not carbon. Um, now, chat DPT. Um, so servers use water to keep cool, as well as lots of energy. A 20 to 50 question conversation with ChatGPT uses how much water? The answer is a pint, which doesn't seem a lot perhaps in rainy Yorkshire, but if you're in a water stressed area, a pint of water for every time anyone's engaging with ChatGPT is gonna start depleting the local resources very, very quickly. Moving on to data. so. The amount of data globally is growing exponentially. On average, how long does it take for global data store to double? And the answer is every two years. And then building on that, how much of the data that we keep does nothing useful? This is what we call dark data. So the proportion of data that's dark globally is a whopping 55%. So of that exponential growth, more than half of it isn't doing anything. And essentially, data equals energy equals carbon. And all of that is being wasted against that 14% prediction of 2040. So when you start to stack these facts up, you start to get into some quite interesting terrain when it comes to this agenda. And then lastly, a really practical one. The video uses significantly more information and thus data and energy than audio. What is the energy saving from switching from video call to an audio call? And the answer is 96%. So an absolutely vast savings. Um, and hopefully those collectively have kind of sort of uh, whetted your appetite a bit to start to think about the topic. So now I'm just, I'm, I, I believe these slides can get circulated after. So I'm not going to run through them in granular detail, but just to give you a bit of a flavour of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, so this is our kind of digital work stream on a slide. You can see our graph on the left that shows where the carbon sits in the technology stack. You can see this uh, seesaw thing on the right that looks at our net, net carbon benefit lens that we use within our work. So we're thinking not only about the carbon within the technology solution, but also how do we use that technology solution to enable maximum carbon benefit, which is really, really important. We do that in a programmatic perspective, uh, looking at particular bits of software or digital projects and interventions. Um, and then on the bottom there, you can see some of our priorities around circular devising, data storage software. Um, and so that, that's a bit of an introduction to the kind of stuff that we've been up to in 2023. Um, and then another bit that's really important to touch on is working with the supply chain. So virtually all digital products are going to have a really significant supply chain to them. Here you can see a version of the NHS supplier roadmap. So you've got such things like that hub German notes around social value and net zero mapped in. Really excitingly, from 2028, we're looking at product-specific carbon footprints, which for digital hardware is already out there. So lots of, you can quite accurately already look at the carbon footprint of a computer or whatever. Um, but for software, that's a really kind of um, developing area and it's really quite a complex kind of calculation. So that's gonna be a real game changer. We've also got these requirements coming from government. So this maps into our government spend controls. In there, there's a bit more. So there's net zero stuff like NHS, but also looking at the economy and transparency and accountability. So that's what we have to we have to demand of our suppliers in that space. We've got some really easy accreditations that we can map into. So things like PCO certified, a really broad 
based carbon uh, sustainability assessment for ICT devices. So there's easy ways around some of this stuff if you can just say use them or equivalent when we're buying stuff. And then there's some really useful parts of it as well. So this one from the cross government sustainable tech community, the star community, DEFRA, and with all those big suppliers in it. So let's um how we can partner, challenge, collaborate, you know, work with the supply chain is really, really important. And then I'm just going to flip over the climate coin very, very briefly to the climate risk piece, which is really, really complicated digital services because of the if you think about the data flow that we rely on. So you've got from the data center through the network to end users, we've got dependencies around energy, around water, around transport links, around all sorts, and most other critical national infrastructures are reliant on digital. So it becomes a bit of a house of cards, but this has been really shone a light on by the fact that we had this big high profile outage in summer 2022 at Dyson St. Thomas's with the, the on-premise data centers that fell over in the heat. If you're interested, I'll definitely note in the chat about the lessons learned report that came from that. Um, and that's, that's really got chief information officers and such like really interested in this topic. And this has been a really useful exercise as well. So the UK Climate Change Commission has flagged up the fact that um, energy security is one of the top eight short-term risks in their 2021 climate change risk assessment. And government has been planning for that, partially off the back of the Ukraine crisis, obviously. But um, now, so that's that's an excellent kind of proxy exercise for climate risk to digital because no energy equals existential risk to digital. So there, there's a bit there. Um, very happy to find collaborators who are working on climate change resilient digital because there's not too many people thinking about it yet. But just to finish off, I was just going to touch on our support offer to the system. So if you're kind of wondering about this net gain approach that I mentioned, there's a little graphic on the left there about it. That that's the software and hardware direct benefits of um, and then the benefits of digitalization as well. And then you can see on the right some of our kind of low carbon design choices. So the, the, this is a short list of our longer checklist that sits in our carbon tooling, which is on the digital net zero futures page. So if you want to, if you've got an NHS.net account, you can go in there and get our tooling off of it. Um, that's already written informally into the NHS England business page practices, but within the, the wider system, we're using that as kind of good practice. We're developing a whole suite of greener digital basic blueprints as well around up to press things like auto power down, buying remanufactured, um, low carbon web searches, heat waves. But in the fullness of time, we'd like to create blueprints that sit alongside all of the things in our low carbon design checklist. Um, we've got other bits of NHS England that are relevant, like the Cloud Centre of Excellence um, that are supporting people in the system to do cloud migration, which is a really important element of decarbonizing the tech stack, because generally speaking, cloud um, is better, certainly better than on-premise data centers. Um, and then we're starting to get funding coming through for ICB engagement as well. So this year is the first time we've funded anyone. We've got Somerset, Sussex, and Humber and North York funded for proof of concept work and the things you can see there, baselining, technical things sustainable digital procurement and best practice case study creation. But really important for me is like, what, what do you guys want? Um, because um, we're, we're building out a support package, but it's really crucial that we are actually answering questions that are relevant to people. So any ideas that you've got, please drop me a note. Um, and yeah, we'd love to kind of chat. There's my email there. There's also that, you, that code goes through to the future site, but there's also a link there to the... Um, BCS Net Zero, a digital journey documentary, which is quite useful context for this topic as well. And just to finish, I'm just going to jump back up Slido page that, so people can just have a quick squiz at the kind of stuff that's, that people have been citing in here. I think I've run out of time, so I'm going to finish that now. But thank you very much for, for completing that Slido. That's really, really useful. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, obviously, the reason we wanted to bring um, NHS Digital into this conversation is the um, the sort of creeping scope of uh, the um, decarbonisation of our digital activities. We talk about things like digitalisation and, you know, going paperless and things. And sometimes it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, um, the carbon intensity of, of digital operations. Um, and it, it, that's why it's so important for us to have Ben on uh, this call today as well to talk about things that are a little bit 
perceived potentially as a little bit more ephemeral uh, than something like the hard bricks and mortar of a of a um, estate or uh, electrifying the fleet, for example. Um, can I please bring Tim in to give literally a couple of minutes intro into 3TI? Um, you guys are speaking on our next webinar, so you'll have a real um, uh, opportunity to engage with our audience. But I wanted to bring you in, Tim, today as the sponsor of this event to say thank you for that and, and to give a bit of an intro to you guys at this point. Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. And thanks, Georgia. Um, have I understood correctly? You don't want a presentation from me, me this morning. No, uh, we don't. We've got about um, only 13 minutes left uh, in I this. Can do, I can do a presentation in 13 minutes. I think we got it. I've, I've actually sat up last night doing a presentation for you. I'm determined to present it. Um, <laughs> OK, I mean, we need to do the Q&A as well. OK, uh, fine. So the, let, look, let, let me go through this really quickly. And, yeah, and okay. thank you very much for having me along. Georgia, I also have to apologise. You sent me a LinkedIn uh, connection request. And I thought, oh, it's another marketing agency, and I deleted it. They're not just another marketing <laughs> agency. <laughs> so look, I, I have got a presentation because this audience is is really um, is is very relevant to what we do. Three uh, Ti is a um, solar company. We, I hope you can see my slides now, my screen. Three um, Ti stands for Three Technology Infrastructure. Those three technologies are solar, batteries, and EV charging and we combine them in car parks. Um, you can see there the sort of clients that we've got. Uh, we've finished a project just recently with Eastbourne Hospital that I've got a few slides for you. Um, we also registered B Corp, which is, is very unusual, A, in the UK, but certainly in the solar and renewable energy uh, sector. Um, our motto is driving on sunshine. Those of you who still drive a petrol and diesel car, you're actually driving on sunshine from 200 million years ago, which was the sunshine that grew the tree that fell over that made the fossil. Um, I'm driving home this afternoon on the sunshine that's shining on, on my solar panels this morning. So that, that's what we do. Um, very, very quickly, I'm going to rattle through this, Georgia. Um, unfortunately, 84% of all energy still comes from fossil fuels around the world. The only way we can get to net zero by 2050 is full electrification and electrification with renewable energy. In the UK... That means increasing the amount of electricity we generate by three times. And it's not just for the electrification of, of uh, uh, transport. Heating require, is going to require three times that. So the challenge is huge. Uh, if we break that down into the three challenges that we see, we need to increase solar energy dramatically by five times. Uh, Nicola was talking about how many charge points she, she's installed with her team. We need 23 times more than that by 2035. And if we're going to do all that, we have to spend 50 billion on upgrading the grid to be able to achieve it. What we do at 3TI is to combine solar batteries and uh, EV charging in car parks primarily. And um, we then put in smart microgrids on site with our various installations, which allow us to connect to places. Nicola, you said you've done a survey of grid capacity surveys on, on your sites. I will wager that we will be able to come out with a much bigger connection than anybody has told you to date for all sorts of clever technical reasons and things that we do. And we find with these systems we can connect quicker and cheaper than the local network operator will tell you. Um, Eastbourne Hospital, very quickly, which is the one that we've just finished, um, here are just some photographs of it. It's about 500 parking spaces just outside the hospital. They give you some idea of what a solar car park looks like. There's the hospital in the background. Um, they were able to keep using 25%, sorry, 75% of the car park all the time we were installing. Um, so we're very used to working in these sites and we know parking is a, is, is a premium on hospitals. Um, and this unit also has 20 EV chargers. This is a staff car park. So those EV chargers are available to staff uh, park during the day when they're at work. Um, that's what it looks like. It all looks very nice. If we want to talk about some numbers, um, you've somebody else was saying they put some solar on a rooftop. Um, if we just really focus on the the left hand sorry the right hand side column um we can either you can either pay for this and you can spend uh, on a on a megawatt install which is about 300 parking spaces you can either spend a million pounds on it or we can fund it and sell you the electricity at 15p and we can do that for the next 25 years without you putting any money in at all and that's precisely what we've done uh, on on our on our sites 
turn that into into money if i'm producing 875 megawatt hours a year and my current electricity price is 30 30p a kilowatt hour and i know from experience that most people are not uh, procuring electricity at 30p it's significantly more than that but that would leave you with an electricity bill um, of 262,000 a year if you buy the electricity on a power purchase agreement at 15p clearly you're halving your electricity bill that's saving you 131,000 pounds from 300 parking spaces which means you're saving 437 pound 50 per parking space per year for 25 years now, if that doesn't allow you to let nurses park free of charge at hospital, I don't know what does. Uh, it might even allow people to give nurses a pay rise. But there is a lot of money to come out of car parks. And these are brownfield sites where we're, we're not taking farmland out of production. It's already there. In many cases, it looks an eyesore. We're putting in uh, CCTV. We're putting in LED lighting. So you're sheltered from the rain and you've got a more secure place to park. That's big car parks. And that's how we do it. Um, we do it either you can pay cash, but if you look at those sort of savings, and I, I, you know, I hear NHS Trust waiting for grants to come through, if you look at the amount of money that you actually save in the year or the 18 months whilst you're waiting for the grant, you're actually quids in by not bothering with the grant and going straight into a power purchase agreement. Uh, we're going to share these slides, I think, aren't we, Georgia? So I'm not going to, not going to dwell on any of them particularly. Um, the big benefits of solar car parking and, and power purchase agreements, no upfront cost, significantly cheaper electricity, and no operational responsibilities from your side. We do it all. And once we've done that, we can put EV charging into car parks that otherwise wouldn't have sufficient capacity to take it and put batteries into the system to run a smart microgrid for you. Projects like Eastbourne take roughly 12 months. From the day I first meet you to the day we switch the thing on, take roughly 12 months. Uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it's all the trick is all those like blue squares where we're doing all the preparation and all the planning and getting thing, everything organized. The actual construction period is probably only about 20 weeks. Um, those projects take a year. We wanted to do something more quick, uh, more quickly, more, a shorter period of time, and we wanted to focus on EV charging. And two years ago, I drew that little sketch there on the left. On the right is the first render of it. In the meantime, we've turned it into a pop-up mini solar car park. We make it out of recycled shipping containers. You can have it in a day. It takes a day to come off a truck and be installed. You don't need planning permission in most places. You don't need a new grid connection, Nicola. We can put it into sites where the DNO are telling you you can't do it. It's a very, very visible commitment to uh, net zero targets, as you can see. Um, We've won five. In fact, we've won six awards in the meantime, but five awards for it. Uh, it has 12 charge points on it. They will charge at three and a half, seven, eleven, 11 and 22. By October, we will have a version on DC, which will charge up to 120 uh, kilowatts. Um, but these at the moment, as somebody else said, where we're, um, staff are standing in, in, in a hospital car park for 8, 10, 12 hours, that will charge their car very happily in, in half a day. Um, as I've said, up to 150 kilowatts coming in the autumn. Um, it has 20 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof. It has a 250 kilowatt battery inside it, and we can connect it to your existing grid connection. We've won five awards, as I've said. You can, uh, we don't sell them. It's the same as same as our big car parks. We rent them. So in, instead of spending two or 300,000 pounds on a new grid connection for new charge points, you can rent this for about 2,000 pounds a month from us. You set the tariff of how much you're going to charge your customers for the electricity. We run the back office. You can access it with an app with RFID or contactless payment. Um, you can have advertising and information screens on it like that. And you can have them painted in your own colours if you want. We've got a, a fitness studio that want them in pink and grey, which we're doing at the moment. We've got one at Ragemore Hospital in uh, Inverness. And uh, the other one that's very open to the public and, and quite accessible is at um, Five Rivers Leisure Centre in Salisbury. We uh, are an award-winning charge safe because uh, we put e uh, CCTV in it. We put waterproof shelters and uh, integrated LED lighting. There is one at Silverstone. If you uh, if you want to go to Silverstone and have a look, there there it is. Um, 
as a company. Um, I'm going to have to cut you off. I there do we are. Done. Much Look, much there we are. Much. Finished. How about oh, that? Thanks. <laughs> um, so thanks so much for, for Tim. You, you will hear more from 3TI on our next webinar, which I do need to jump straight into what we have because we only have three minutes left uh, on this session. Everyone who's asked a question, I really, really appreciate that. Um, the panelists have been doing really, really well and gone through and answered a load of them personally and typed in some quest uh, some answers. And Ben has been working away furiously on the chat function as well, uh, chatting away with people. What I'm going to do is I've copy and pasted all of your questions. I'm going to pose them to our panelists and have their answers written up in the full event write-up, which will be sent to everyone here uh, on email as well. So um, don't worry about those questions. We will get them answered for you if you put them in the Q&A. If you've put them in the chat, please now transfer them over to the Q&A uh, and we'll make sure that they get posed to the panel. Um, really quickly from our side, from sustainability partnerships uh just wanted to share with you um what we have going on for the rest of the year can everyone see my screen now let me know if you've got a thanks so much uh for so for sustainability partnerships what we have coming up for the rest of the year some events so we have the awards um at the end of this month we've had a record number of people um, submitting awards for both businesses and NHS trusts. Um, our shortlist will be coming out at the end of this week. So super excited for those awards. Thank you so much to everyone who entered and all of the judges. The award um, entry, um, a sorry the the event is still open for anyone to sign up to to see uh, who's winning those awards uh 21st of february we've got the future of um healthcare is green and look at sustainable tech solutions so that's when we're going to be hearing more from the 3ti team Ooh. next uh we have world water day which we always celebrate um on the 22nd of march and then we're going to be having uh, an nhs versus plastic pollution um event in april uh, the Sustainability Day of Action, this is something that's happened every single year, and this is before we even started Sustainability Partnerships. This is when it was, the, the whole campaign was the Sustainability Day of Action. Some of you might remember that uh, from a few years ago before we took over and did the rebrand. Um, it's a big event. It's a flagship. It's what we do every year, and it's what we're based on. What we want to know a little bit more from you guys is what you would like to see. We've done toolkits, webinars, competitions. We've created other resources. We've done videos. Um, we want to know this year what does uh what, what's going to help for engagement around sustainability within your trust so we're actually going to be sending out a survey uh, in the next few weeks to get a little bit of insight from you guys to really build out a day that's going to be helpful insightful useful valuable uh and help towards the that nhs uh, journey we've got uh, loads more support um on the website now that we used to, than we used to have we're not just doing webinars we're not just doing content uh we're doing in-person sustainability summits this year so this is where uh, we've booked in with certain trusts around the country. Uh, we come to you and we create a half day or a full day in-person event. We look at your sustainability agenda. We look at your green plan. We figure out what your uh, priorities are. And we engage with the local uh, business community uh, in your local area to say, these are some of the um, potential businesses that you can be engaging with um, to see you towards those uh, goals. So if anyone, uh, any of the trusts that we've not already spoken to is interested in us running a sustainability summit at your premises at some time this year, please do get in touch with us because we're starting to roll those out very soon. Um, and then we also have communi uh, communication and engagement support. So this is what I was saying to Tim, that we are not just your normal marketing agency. We also come in and uh, look at your green plans. We can create full um, animated versions of your green plans, like the animation that you saw at the start of this session. Uh, we're doing um, anything that you need printed, physical um, email uh, or physical or email and newsletters. We're doing TV screen. We're doing social media. We're doing anything that you need. Uh, within your trust to uh, ensure that you are engendering um, that sustainable uh, sustainability mindset right through to every single member of staff and you're engaging with everyone. So that is what we have coming up at Sustainability Partnerships for throughout the year. Sadly, we have uh, run out of time on this event and it's been unbelievably well engaged with. I really, really appreciate everyone 
submitting everything in the chat and I know that some people are, people are starting to fall away now because we are slightly over time um, so I appreciate everyone uh, for staying on uh, thanks so much for, for uh, to, to Nikki um, amazing presentation we will share those slides so much happening in Wales and we're really excited about what you've got uh, happening there um, Richard there were some questions specifically for you as well um, I know that a lot of people are interested in you sharing the, some of the best practice that you were talking about and how that can be uh, knowledge shared across uh, across the country and um, Ben there was a million questions for you I know that you've been beavering away and answering as many as possible and that you are absolutely uh, an open book uh, waiting for um, for questions from people so uh, you've already put your email address in um, the chat but we will share that as well along with the event write-up and the slides and the video and everything that goes along with what we've done today and um, we will consider next time an hour and a half. We just don't like to take that much time out of people's day. And we do try to jam pack as much as we can into one session. Uh, but we will consider next time having a little bit more time. People can just decide whether they can and can't stay. But thank you to everyone else who has um, stayed with us this long, has engaged with us. Um, and we'll see you hopefully uh, in February next month uh, with Tim um, and some other speakers on some amazing new technological advancements um, in sustainability. But until then have an amazing day everyone be careful if you if there is any snow um and we'll see you next time